Hey everybody, what we're going to go over today is correspondence analysis in R and Python. So this is for my natural language processing class, specifically focusing on human language analysis. So in this lecture, I'm going to look at color terminology. This is the famous Berlin K theory, which was discussed in the first week's lecture. And then I'm also going to talk more about categories, which is discussed in last week's lecture. So fairly soon the entire course will be online for you to view, and this one kind of goes third in that series. We are using R and Python, so I have loaded the Reticulate library, and I'm using my virtual environment for Reticulate, so just so you can see my configuration. For correspondence analysis, you will also need the prints package for Python. So in R, you can do py install um, and then do prints. So that should install it into your virtual environment or whatever Python um, uh, library you are using. Like, not library, um, yeah, library. Wherever, which Python you're using. Since I have like four or five on my computer, this one is specifically my Reticulate library. All right, so to go over this color term theory, again, the basic idea from Berlin and K was that linguistic interpretation of color and color vocabulary kind of falls into these categories. So a lot of the, the analyses that we're focusing on at the beginning of this course are categorical. So they're frequency counts or they're variables that are, you know, labels instead of continuous data. And then we're slowly going to move into continuous data and then more vector modeling techniques. So the theory is that we sort of start by using a black-white distinction, and as language evolves, you slowly add more and more color categories to the linguistic repertoire. So you'll move into red, and then you'll add green and yellow, then blue, so that you end with a more complex or more inter linguistic interpretation includes the um, non-primary colors like purple, pink, orange, and gray. So it's kind of this um, order of operations of how color um, representation should occur. And what we're going to do is see if those map using a simple correspondence analysis. Okay. So this data is from the Corpus of Contemporary American English. And it's literally just the adjective use of color terms in count format. So for correspondence analysis, simple correspondence analysis, the type of data that you'll have is a frequency table. So I loaded the Rling library that comes with the how to, do, how to do linguistics in R book. And I pulled up the data, it's color register. So what we have is a bunch of colors. This only printed the first six lines, but the colors you saw in the previous slide in four different registers. A register just means type of, of language. So we've got fiction, spoken, academic, and press. And the numbers here represent just a frequency count of how many times those words were used as an adjective in those types of, um, uh, not diction, those types of discourse. Okay. So one key issue that we have to deal with that we talked about briefly when we did dispersions was that different um, corpuses have different sizes. So, you know, black appears to be more common in press, but it's also true that that press category is one of the largest ones. So we have to find some way to deal with the fact that the um, representation is biased by the size of the corpora. And so I want to briefly talk about chi-square, because I used to teach correspondence analysis and people were just kind of like, eh, I don't know if I get it. And then I realized that not a lot of my students have had chi-square. So if you've had plenty of chi-square, you can kind of tune me out for a couple minutes. But if you haven't, um, it's an analysis that's used on this sort of uh, count data to tell us if specific frequencies are different than we might expect. And what we might expect is it biasing itself towards larger corpora. Okay, so this will help us deal with the fact that the count sizes are naturally different because they have more words. 
Um, so I'm going to run a very simple combination to talk about the math behind chi-square. So I'm just going to use uh, rows one and two and columns one and two to look at the difference between blue and black and spoken and fiction. Okay, clearly one, a black is used way more than blue and our fiction category is much larger than our spoken category. So how do we deal with that? Well, what we'll do is we'll calculate our expected values based on the size of the row and the column. So this is sort of marginalizing or normalizing, depending on your favorite word here, uh, those particular uh, rows and columns. So our E, our expected value, is based on row and column totals, so row total times column total, divided by the complete sample size. And to do that, I've just run this little R chunk, and I would normally not do it this way. I would just run the chi-square test and look at it. But I think it helps to view like what mathematically is happening sometimes. And so we're going to pretend like we're hand calculating this, but make the computer do the math so I can't screw it up. So for my expected values, I would calculate the row sums, and so I'm just adding across and then column sums, adding down. And the expected value for row one, column one, is row one's uh, total times column one's total, right, divided by the total of the entire square. And then we do the same thing. So row one, column two, two, one, two, two. If I print those out, here are my expected values. So here are the real values, right? These are our observed scores. And then here's our expected scores. So given the row and column totals, the amount of blacks that we found and the amount of spoken words there were that were blue or black, here's what I might expect to find. So you'll notice it's biased more towards fiction because there are just more words in the fiction category and definitely more towards black because there are more black adjectives found. And so I think this is the part that most people get stuck on is like, we're, it just appears like we're kind of shifting the data around, but what we're doing is, you know, sort of given the fact that we know that this corpora is larger and that this word occurs more often, how likely should I find each category effectively? And so it's kind of thinking about if, if all other things are equal, right, what might I expect the values to be? So this is kind of like creating a null hypothesis because I don't expect them to be zero. That's silly. Um, what I expect them to be is proportionate to the, the, the row and column totals. Um, so chi-square is effectively a measure of how different it is from expectation. An expectation is usually our null hypothesis. And so in many tests that means zero, but in this test that means, you know, sort of given the where the data lies, where might I expect um, the values to be. So a simpler solution is to just use chi-square.test. Um, and the argument for chi-square.test is the frequency table. And then once you save that, you can do dollar sign expected and get those same values. Okay, so that's why I said I wouldn't normally calculate them all out this way. But I do think it helps um, to, to show you that it's row one total times column one total divided by the total of the entire frequency table. Here, in comparison now, I put both of them on the same slide. So here's our expected values and here's our observed values. So given the proportions of rows and columns, we're seeing a lot more um, at, in the observed values, we see more black and spoken than we might expect and less blue. So we're seeing it bias more towards black. So that represents, that would match the Berlin K theory that you would expect more of the lower color registers, right? So more um, early linguistic words. In fiction, we see the opposite. There's less black than we might expect and more blue than we might expect. 
In a very simple small table like this, you'll often find these sort of flipped patterns because there's nowhere else for the data to go. So if you see more of one, you're probably going to see less of the other. In larger frequency tables, um, the data can be more complex than that. So the formula for chi-square is the summation of our observed values minus our expected values squared, all divided by our expected values. So hopefully that brings up a slight memory of the standard deviation formula, which is the sum of each person minus the mean squared divided by n minus 1. This is effectively the same idea, but now we're doing, dealing with frequency counts. So it's the sum of each particular cell minus its expected value divided by its expected value. Now we square these because otherwise this would sum to zero. So the same reason. But we don't unsquare this particular one. It's called chi-square for a reason. If I were to do that on my data that I calculated by hand, I get a very large number. So chi-square can get, values can get very large very fast because any deviation from, from the expected values creates a, a, a summation in that chi-square, right? And then it's squared. So uh, especially with large frequency counts, these numbers can get quite big. Now if I, I look at the one from the uh, statistic, which is the chi-square.test, it's saved output. I get a slightly different number, and that's because it actually um, does not, it does an estimation and a little bit of a correction. So not quite the same numbers, but very close. Um, and that number is very large. So I would probably reject the null. And the null here would be that the observed values equal the expected values. They are exactly what we would have expected. And here they're maybe not quite what we would have expected. Now I've done this with two variables, where I have register and color, and that's a chi-square test of independence. I can also do a chi-square test, which is one value. And then generally your expected scores are some sort of proportion you expect in the population or equal, equal proportions. So for example, we could test if the, um, the gender distribution in our courses is what we would expect given STEM, right? or are they equal? So I can apply specific proportions or e equality proportions, meaning each cell is equally likely. Okay. With independence test, um, what we would want to see is that the, the, the expected value is calculated by a proportion of row and column totals. That's how we calculate expected scores. So with chi-square, the issue is it doesn't really tell me what is different. Just like ANOVA. It says, well, something's different. Good luck finding it. So the way that you might know what is different is to use a standardized residual. Some people suggest, much like ANOVA, break down the little proportions and do a chi-square, a different chi-square test. So let me back up. So we know something's different, so I could compare black spoken versus fiction, and then blue spoken versus fiction. Or I could go down, for spoken is black and blue different, for fiction is uh, black and blue different. That's one option. I tend to suggest to use a, the standardized residuals because they're easy to do and I think they give you um, an answer that is interesting although if you're wanting to directly compare proportions I would tell you to to follow up using many proportion tests so what the heck are residuals well the residuals are a similar form um, to residuals in a normal analysis where I'm going to take my observed value minus my expected score and just see how different they are divided by the square root of the expected score. And the standardized residuals are kind of z-scored. The formula is not as simple as what I have it as here, 
where I have O minus E divided by the square root of the variance of the residuals. It isn't quite that mathematically simple because of the way the variance for the residuals is calculated. But the basic idea is that we're standardizing standard error effectively. Okay. And so I would get those from my chi-square.test and the, the code for it is dollar sign residuals. And so we can look at the residuals here, which are mathematically O minus E divided by the square root of E. But those are hard to interpret. Um, I, I mean, easily I can say that black is more than expected because the number is positive. Blue is less than expected because the number is negative. But if I want to put this in terms where I could say this is more than I uh, than chance, so to speak, or more than we would expect, standardized residuals are really nice because they're z-scores. And z-scores have known p-values. So 1.96 or 2, if we round, most people say that the, the difference is larger than one would expect um, if the z-score is more than 2, much like an outlier analysis or a z-test. You can go higher. And then here, what we see is they're very large, 47. So um, not really totally fair to pit black against blue here because black is so, uh, way more common than blue. Um, but what we find is that there are very large differences. The way I would interpret this is that in spoken registers, black is more common than I might expect and blue is less common than I might expect. So in a spoken register, we're seeing earlier color theory. In fiction, however, that, that values are switched where blue is more common than I would expect and black is less common than I would expect. So fiction is a later color register. And the interesting thing is that they have different spots on the Berlin K theory. So that's essentially how chi-square works and correspondence analysis is chi-square on steroids. So let us try some of that. So one thing we can do to visualize this, because data viz is so important, is use a mosaic plot. And it's a visualization of our standardized residuals and our chi-square analysis. What you'll see is the box size. This will make sense in a minute when the picture's on the screen, but the box size is related to the observed cell size. So larger boxes indicate more observed data. The color is based on the direction and the strength of the residuals. So brighter colors mean stronger residuals. Blue is more than expected. Red is less than expected. And we can make that by using this cool mosaic plot code. So we put in the first argument is the data frame, the, the frequency table. The second argument is for the access label style, so perpendicular is 2. Shade equals true to color in those boxes, and then I just gave it a name, register variation. So it's actually flipped the matrix a little bit from how I was looking at it, but you know, we could flip it. So spoken here and black, fiction and black. So the size of this box represents the fact that this is the largest observed value. And then for blue, here's the smallest observed value. The color here, these two red, means that's less than we might expect given the row and column totals. The blue here means this is more than we might expect. And often you get these kind of um, corresponding flipped patterns when you have a small uh, frequency table. And these just make it a lot easier to read. So even though this fiction category is the largest corpora, um, what we're actually seeing is that it's less than we might expect given the size of the fact that fiction is so large. Now let's do all of the data. Now I didn't run a chi-square analysis, it's correspondingly um, a very large number, but I just plotted the entire data frame this time. So what we see is black and white are definitely the largest 
um, categories, okay, along with press, it's a very big category, and fiction. So I can tell right away which two are the largest observed values. And then um, our small ones, gray, orange, pink, and purple, that represents uh, Berlin K theory because that's the, the last li linguistic trend you'd see. And we would go through and just try to interpret this. For black, we see a lot more in spoken, academic, and press languages. In comparison, black and white should kind of go together. They should have the same pattern, and they almost do. We're seeing a little less impressed than we might expect. And then we could go through the entire kind of Berlin K theory and see how it lines up. Do they appear to come together or not? Right? So do they have the same patterns if they're in the same um, area of the, of the projected path of color, color terms? Now, this is just a, a, an understanding of chi-square about expected frequencies what we can do with those is then plot them in space. So correspondence analysis sort of identifies the systematic relationships between variables in, in a low dimension space, meaning 2D or 3D usually. And it's very similar to a multidimensional scale, principal components analysis, or exploratory factor analysis. And we're going to do some of those in next week, okay, or in two weeks. And what this allows me to do is take this chi-square analysis where I can talk about things are more often than I expect or less often than I would expect and turn that into a dimensional space so I can see which ones kind of cluster together. Okay, we're not doing cluster analysis, but that's a good word, which ones group together. And so, uh, yeah, it's chi-square on steroids. <laughs> so to do that, we would in R, so I'll show you Python in a minute, we would use the CA library for correspondence analysis. And it's so easy. I love how brilliantly easy this is. The function is CA and then the data set. Okay, the data set, remember here, needs to be in frequency table format. And it definitely helps if you have row and column labels on this table, which we do. Okay. So I label this SCA model for simple correspondence analysis. Let's look at that output. First thing you're gonna see are these inertias and eigenvalues. Okay. We'll talk about those on the next couple slides, but effectively here, what we can discover is that with three dimensions, we can plot all of the data. So we can capture all of the relationships between our, our registers by using three dimensions. However, that first dimension captures 78% of the data. This is a good sign. That means the data isn't so complex that we can't represent it in a low dimensional space. Two, um, two dimensions capture 97% total, and that last dimension is 3% of the variance, but it captures everything. And then you get some information about the um, rows and columns, but here we're more interested in the idea of these inertias. So what the heck is inertia? Okay. And what those do is they explain how much variance is accounted for by each dimension. So kind of like R squared. Okay. And they're similar to eigenvalues, or they are eigenvalues. Some of the underlying numbers in there are eigenvalues that we've seen in the last several analyses in a previous semester. In this semester, we actually haven't covered eigenvalues quite yet. And so eigenvalues are a mathematical representation of variance. Okay. To, to boil them down into their simplest terms, where large eigenvalues mean a large grouping of variance. And so those are converted into inertias, which explain how much variance. Because one problem with eigenvalues is that they don't really have a scale. You know, it's hard to understand what a six means um, because it's dependent on the data. However, I know six is large, having done a lot of exploratory factor analysis, which we'll do in a couple weeks, but it's much easier to interpret 78% of the variance. So inertia helps us convert that into a scale we can understand. So what it's doing is it's trying to represent the relationship between these variables in as few dimensions as possible. 
So this is a, cluster, a set of analyses that I would consider dimension reduction. So cluster analysis, um, uh, principal components analysis, factor analysis, you're trying to take data and represent it in a way that is simple. And so we're trying to say, well, you know, there's four reg color registers and 10 terms, but we can reduce that down into this kind of simplistic three-dimensional model. And in reality, two-dimensional model captures most of the data here. So the first two dimensions capture 97% of the variance, and that third dimension helps us capture all of it. Okay, that's not always true. We won't always get all of the variance, but this data set um, is captured by three dimensions. So what does that even look like? Let's just throw in the model into the plot command. This is all still R. And for a two-dimensional model, this is really, really interesting. Okay. So it plots um, the rows and the columns. So we see our, our columns, our registers here, and then our, our rows, which are black and white, coming over here together, green, red, and orange kind of clustering together, um, blue, yellow, purple, pinks over here. Gray is kind of an odd one out. but what this allows me to do is to really think about how they're kind of grouping together. So you could talk about this by dimension. So dimension one seems to really separate black and white versus everything else. If I think about the midline here. Dimension two seems to give us a better split between the, um, the primary colors, right? And then the, the more um, not primary colors. I don't have a good label for this. Uh, it also allows me to see which ones are most related. So uh, black and white are really pulling together over here in the spoken category. Press is kind of tied more to green, red, and orange. Fiction, more uh, very descriptive color terms, more distinct terms. Academic over here in the boring category of being very black and white, so kind of separated from that a little bit. Okay, so the distance here represents how related they are. So how are these plots kind of different from other, other plots, right? So terms are close together if they have similar frequency account, counts. So we don't want to think about this as like a correlation or a scatter plot um, because scatter plots, you're trying to find some linear trend usually, but here we're just looking for which ones are close together. Um, and what that would imply in a correspondence analysis is that the rows or the columns have similar profiles. Okay, sometimes it's called profile um, or behavioral profiling. Um, <clears throat> so that's different from having a similar relationship to a latent variable. So they, they have similar characteristics, okay, which is different than saying these things are related to some uh, unnamed uh, underlying phenomenon. Okay. The distances on the map are a representation of chi-square, um, so that's why I said it's chi-square and steroids. How, how different that is from sort of the average, so it's like how far it is from the middle. Okay. And then my interpretation for this specific analysis is does this kind of match Berlin K? Well, what do we see? Black and white come together, which is not kind of expected. Red's over here on its own. Yellow is doing its own thing. So yellow, this part does not match. Okay. So then we've got blue, brown, purple, pink, and then orange. So yellow and orange are kind of our, our odd ones out. But in general, it kind of maps on to this idea of, of different registers for different colors. Some other interesting things to note about this data set that are just kind of fun. Um, the press category is close to green red because of cultural phenomenon. Um, because there's political orientation for those terms. Um, and that's why blue kind of pulls that way and then proper names. So the red cross and the green bay packers. And so we see the influence of like proper cultural names on um, this theory. 
fiction is likely closer to the later color terms because uh, people want you to paint them a picture of the data, right? So there are, are of the story. And so there's more descriptive terms um, and more shade usage because we want to paint the best picture of what's happening, okay. rather than saying something is black or white. And it appears the academic and spoken speech, I jokingly am gonna say they're pretty boring because things are black and white, which is kind of a, um, a slang phrase, right? So uh, they don't tend to use um, the later color terms because you know things are one or the other. So before we get into a 3D plot of this picture, how can I do the same analysis in Python? So I'm going to try to keep the Python and R chunks with a little label on top. If you're looking at the markdown, it's, it's clearer because the chunks have uh, the marker. But once you knit this into a, um, a slideshow, it doesn't, I didn't realize this until um, a lecture the other night, but it doesn't show you which one's which. So all of them are going to be labeled here at the top just to help you keep track. Um, as you're learning code if you haven't if you can't see the distinction between the codes quite yet so we're going to use that prints package or library i'm going to pull in the data from r now i don't have to i could just like use it directly but i think it's a little easier if i just transfer it over into my python environment and so i do r dot col reg to pull it over and i'm just going to call it color register in Python, if you're familiar with some of the machine learning kind of stuff, you set up a function effectively. So we're gonna call our function CA. That's prints.ca. So we're just gonna kind of save it as its own name. Okay, this is kind of common Python um, style. We're gonna say that there are two components. Okay, that means a 2D model. Iterate three times. You can tell it to iterate more if it needs to. Um, copy equals true, check input equals true, engine equals auto, these are all defaults, and random state equals 42. I think someone is a um, Douglas Adams Hitchhiker's Guide fan. You could make that number up. Okay. Now I'm going to fit it to my data. So we'll see this dot fit command a lot this semester. So we're going to use our CA function and fit it to this color register data. So this is kind of like in R doing the CA function. And I overwrote my original one because now I have a model that I've built. And I can tell it to give me the inertias again. So in a 2D model, check out how similar these are. So we said, you know, 78% of the variance and then another 19% of the variance is the same answer. We could change this to three components and look at the three factor or three dimension model. And we'd probably see that last 2% pop in. So, you know, we've talked before about which one's easier, Python or R. It's kind of a comparison this semester. And I'd argue those are both equally easy. I think this one takes a little bit more typing to set up, but um, gives you the same approximate answer. So how do we get that graph? We're going to do ca.plot coordinates and it's going to plot all those underlying values for us. X here represents the data frame. And then I left all the rest of this as the default from what the prints vignette told me to do and I think it worked pretty well. And then I do ax.get figure, so print the picture. So save the picture, print the picture. That's actually quite nice. Um, what we'll have, what we'll see here is it'll call it component zero and component one, um, but we'll get the exact same picture flipped. Okay, for some reason it's mirrored, but you know, it's the same one. And so honestly here, which one would I pick? Um, I would tell you to pick the one that you're better at the language. For me, that would be R. R is faster in the sense that um, there are less lines of code, but um, the Python model will give you the exact same output. Now I can also do 3D plots in R, I did not try this in Python, <laughs> but there's a, a function plot3d.ca for a model. 
And to do that, once I did that, it ran in the background and then popped up a little chart, which I will need to rerun to show you. So it runs in this extra little window. It's not the most beautiful picture. I think Plotly, the Plotly package would, would work a little better for this. Um, but I have not figured out how to do it. So uh, what you can see is, and the nice thing is it's manipulatable. So now I can see exactly how far spoken is away from black and white and academic is from black and white. So you can get kind of a better feel for the ones that are all on top of each other in a flat model. You can now see how much, you know, red, green, and orange are kind of on top of each other. Okay. And they aren't. Right. And so then what we see is that gray is still really far out there, but pink, purple, brown are pretty close, and blue and yellow are slightly away. So you can kind of view this a little bit more fine-grained for a 3D model. Okay. So that's simple correspondence analysis. Let's take a switch now into categories. So last week we talked about categories and category formation. Um, let's apply another analysis to it. So is there a difference in the categories for stole? which is chair, I'm probably butchering that, and Cecil, which is armchair. So in the night in 1959, uh, Gipper had subjects name pictures of chairs. So you imagine being in this experiment where you sit down and you think you're doing some super secret, fun, psych experiment, and he's like, here's some pictures, what is this? And you're just like, chair, <laughs> armchair. Um, just to think about their relative frequencies. So this is us getting corpora size. And then asked participants, like using their labels and the coding on the pictures, and you'll see this data in a second, figured out what is the categorical underlying featural difference. So this allowed us to think about prototypes. What was the prototype for chair versus armchair? It also allowed us to think about feature checklist theory that we talked about last week. Um, in its differences of which features went with which category. And the original analysis show that chairs are more functional and armchairs are more about comfort. I don't know that this translates into American English quite so well because armchair seems kind of stuffy to me, <laughs> but maybe lazy boy is more about comfort. Right? And our, our usage of brand names as category labels. So that data, not from um, the 1959 data, but the new data that we can look at, is coded from an online shopping store based on their text descriptions. And so this is where I really want you to see the types of data that are necessary for each of these analyses, because this is kind of key. One thing about linguistic analyses and modeling human language is that you have to think about the type of data that you have. So in the simple correspondence analysis, I have frequency counts usually of two variables. In a multiple correspondence analysis, I have labels, which I could convert to frequency counts. And these are categorical. We're slowly gonna move towards using um, continuous data. So I think next, lectures on cluster analysis, which we could do on categorical or continuous data. Then we'll move into factor analysis, which is much more for con continuous data. But let's say I have this kind of table, though it didn't print very well, where I have uh, IKEA as <laughs> website. I'm a huge IKEA fan, so I love this example. Um, you have its category, its function, and what kind of um, age for the person sitting in it, what kind of back it has, does it swivel, um, does it have, is it soft, is it upholstered, so we have like all these labels over what the um, descriptions tags include on the online site. So with that we have completely categorical data 
and we can try a multiple correspondence analysis. We're going to use the Facto Mine R library for some visualization purposes. And I'm going to build my model using MCA, the multiple correspondence analysis, in caps. CA analysis is in lowercase. I'm going to run that on my chairs data set and I'm going to drop the first three columns, which I, oops, don't think I did in Python, so this will be interesting. Um, but <laughs> I'm going to drop those first three columns because those are the name of the store and the um, category label that was given to it. And we want to just look at the actual descriptions first. And then I told it to print out a summary. So we get our eigenvalues and our percents of variance like we did before. And so it actually gives me a bunch of different dimensions. And the data keeps going. <laughs> it gives you like a ton of stuff. So let's interpret each piece one at a time. So I might plot this okay, using the plot function. CEX here just tells you how big the words to print color the variable names in black, color their indices, excuse me, in gray. And what that means here in a two-dimensional model, um, what we see is the, the row labels are in gray, which aren't super useful because we have so many of them. Um, but if you had less of them, it could be interesting to, to figure out which ones cluster together. This is hard for, for reading purposes. Um, and then we have all of the categorical options for the columns, so the, the clustering variables. If I wanted to um, color the indicators, I could also add this little invisible line. I did not in this example. I will in another example in a second. So this is hard to read, but what can I get from this? Well, there clearly is a category of chairs over here that is separated from the middle kind of everything category. And what we can do is look at what those labels are to give it a label. Okay, it's got an adjustable back, uh, an adjustable seat depth, an adjustable seat height. It's probably labeled a work chair and it swivels. So it's literally an office chair that I'm sitting in right now. Over here, we can see that this is a recliner. It rocks. It has an added function of being a bed, although that's kind of interesting. This is, to me, seems to be more of my lazy boy category that leans back and it's, it reclines. Okay, maybe you can take a nap in it. And this is sort of the ambiguous everything else category okay, that is either your high top seat. These look to me like your kind of working seats, right? your kitchen chairs, um, and sofas, that kind of stuff. Okay. So work, sleep, everything else. So I want to know how useful, like what are the most important variables? We can do this dim desk function for dimension describe. And it'll give us the um, each dimension one at a time. So for the first dimension, um, I get the R squares in uh, descending order. And this is just which one is the most important. So you can interpret these as the larger they are, the more important they are to that descriptor. Okay, so remember, this is a kind of thinking about categories. This would be our features, our checklist for that category. So that first one is upholstered. It has a material seat. It function is important, it's soft, it swivels, and it rolls. And then we can also see the p-values associated with those. But more importantly, um, these are the names of the variables. More importantly, down here I get um, uh, an estimate, a sort of a regression coefficient, it's not really what it is, but it's kind of interpreted that way, of the actual category. So it's not upholstered not soft, doesn't swivel, doesn't roll, made of wood. Function is more than likely not specific or eats. It has a mid back, a normal seat, no arms. This is sounding a lot like a formal dining room chair to me. 
um, except it might be plastic. Okay. And so the, the first like several um, descriptors here kind of tell me that this is like your, your um, wood formal dining room chair that you're not allowed to actually eat at, right? It's only for special occasions like holidays. And then we could keep going. Now we'll tell us all of these, um, but we probably want to interpret the most, the strongest ones because they're in remember uh, reverse order. So we can see that function for dimension two is still the most important one. But what is that? Let's scroll down a little bit. Okay. And so now we can look at these. So this one it does not recline. It does adjust. It does roll. It's a work chair. Okay. Um, we get a separate no recline, it does swivel, it does adjust seats. So this is like our office chairs that you'd see that you can like raise and lower. And I do think we'd get a third dimension here. Yeah, okay. that's third dimension. It's an adult chair of the outdoor function that maybe is metal okay, or um, one of those kind of bowl chairs. So this one's a little bit more mixed of of what this chair might be okay, so to me this kind of captures the everything else category so these are much easier to read okay, uh, than the chart when we have so many different category labels okay. so just kind of a summary of everything we just went through the r squared values represent the variables association with that dimension okay. the p values are strength of that association when we use dollar sign category, that tells us the directionality of the relationship. So it could be positive, could be negative. If the value is positive, it will show up on our right hand side of our plot representing a positive coefficient and vice versa. If it's a negative, it'll be on the left hand side of the plot, indicating that it's less likely to occur with that dimension. And kind of our overall interpretation is that first dimension seems to represent sort of comfortable chairs. That second dimension seems to represent more functional chairs like work chairs. And our third dimension is kind of a mix. It's a little bit harder to understand because it seems to be kind of like outdoor chairs or, um, you know, sofa-y kind of chairs. And that appears to be three different categories, comfortable relaxation chairs, comfortable adjust work, adjustable work chairs, and these sort of multifunctional chairs for your use at your house. All right, now these are coming from um, a textbook example. And I think the nice thing about these sort of analyses is, um, you know, they, they are very visual, so it can make these cool vis, uh, data vis pictures of the analysis, but they do lend themselves to what I call interpretive dance. So much of linguistic analysis is, uh, I hate to say in the eye of the beholder because I'm using so many slang terms in one lecture, but the idea is that you have to create a picture of what's happening, so you, you make you know, this, this beautiful chart, but then you have to interpret it. And everybody might interpret it slightly differently. Um, and so I'm, you know, representing what uh, the, the dimension data gave to me. But, uh, oops, I actually went forward instead of back. Uh, if I look at the actual picture here, I might see a slightly different picture. So this is my work chair, right? We talked about this being our comfortable chair. But then when I get into the dimension data, I might see something um, a bit different uh, because of which ones are the strongest. Okay. So I tell you to interpret both. All right. So another thing we can do is take that label that, that was given to the chair based on the um, items list in the online marketplace. Uh, and that's in column three of our data set, excuse me. <clears throat> and we can map that on the analysis as a supplementary variable. 
So to do that, I have rerun my model and included that third variable. But here we'll say supplementary variable is column number one. Because when I drop the first two columns, which are just for data collection purposes, it's now the first column left. Then I plotted that. And here this time I used the invisible. So I made the indicators invisible. Those are the row names. I made the column variable dark gray, and that column variable is our, our indicator or supplementary variable. I'm sorry, our column variable, I'm sorry, here is our um, category labels, right? Uh, the supplemental variable here is black. So which one's armchair and which one's chair? Right here, so here's chair, here's armchair. That seems to map onto the old analyses because we don't really have a good one capturing work chairs. Okay. So this was chair, kind of everything category of chair. This one was the, you know, our, our comfortable plush chairs, so armchair. And here's work, but we haven't found one for work. So this gives us a really nice picture of those categories and their features for featureless theory and helps us think about the fact that we're missing an entire category over here. Like there's no label for this one. So we would need to maybe think about adding that label. But so to kind of create these prototypes, we can do plot ellipses function. So I put in model two. I use the first column to label them because that's where you know our category labels are. And what it did was it figured out which one it was closest to. And so our work chairs actually got lumped into the stole or everything category. And then um, Cecil stole our like, kind of comfortable chairs. And uh, some of you'll know some of them are, are, are crossing boundary lines, so to speak, because they uh, appear to plot or to cluster with the other category, but have a have the opposite label. Okay. So um, these are what they're labeled in in the data set. Okay. So because of this extra work category that's kind of not being captured by a different category name, you'll see that stole here is pulled towards it. Right, recessive seems to be kind of right in the middle of these over here, with a couple of them that that categorically seem to be in the wrong. Um, label. Okay. And this is a great example of that idea of fuzz, fuzzy boundaries that we've covered, where we've talked about how things like penguins are very difficult because, sure, they're birds, they don't fly, and right? they don't really sing. And so we have these categories where um, the boundaries are not clear. Okay. So these confidence ellipses don't overlap. So we would consider them pretty distinct categories or pretty distinct prototypes. We could also do more of a 95% confidence interval type model. So to do that, in that same kind of plot ellipses function, I do means equals false. Okay. And so this captures, you know, 95% of those, of those instances, okay. so sometimes called concentration ellipses. And this um, just il illustrates better this idea of fuzzy boundaries. So the places where these overlap, you might expect to see people give them one name or the other. So the places where they don't overlap, you would expect them to say, well, this is a Cecil. But here in the middle, these examples, you might get, you might get one name or you might get another. Um, so this really represents fuzzy boundaries. Where, and so this to me would be a better idea of, of kind of like exemplar theory, where I have lots of examples. This will let me back up here. Here, this gives you a more, a better example of which ones might be the prototype, or sort of the average of these four. Okay. okay, but there's only one in there, there is one clear exemplar. Okay. Um, here, this might be kind of like, if I took the average of all of these, it would be more of a prototype. All right, that's a plot again. So back to inertia. So what can I do about thinking about variance for the model? 
We can tell it to print our eigenvalues and this will give us this proportion of variance. And in two dimensions, we're not capturing a whole lot of variance. Okay, remember we have a lot more variables though. There is some um, suggestion here that those inertia values are not actually representative. They're not comparable to, to what people might expect inertia values to be. So there's a special model type, this MJCA, that actually kind of converts back to the inertia that people were used to for regular correspondence analysis. And that one gives us a, be, uh, a, a better picture, right? So the first dimension is about 47% of the data. We add another quarter for a second dimension. And if we go into the third dimension, we're only getting 3% of the variance. And so the model actually suggests that four dimensions are better than nothing. Um, but here, we've only plotted it in two-dimensional space. We could do 3D space, 4D space. I don't know how you plot it. But we could also try a, three, a 3D model if we wanted to. All right, so I did this on the entire data frame instead of dropping those first two columns. So let's see what we get from here, but I will probably re-knit this together and only use the right columns here, brain fart. But you'll find in Python, this is actually very similar. So as long as you get the hang of this idea of creating a a analysis type and then fitting it, it's uh, approximately the same. So it's prints.mca. Okay, I've already imported the prints library. I'm gonna go two components. I could do a 3D model, but I'm doing two. And then the, the uh, arguments are pretty much the same. Okay. I pulled over my chairs data set and I fit it on all of the data, which is my fault. But let's see what we get. Okay. First thing we get is a bunch of warnings, but if I come down here and skip past all the warnings, um, I can look at my inertia values, remembering that I did this slightly wrong. Um, we actually get numbers that are closer to the original inertia values. So let's say it's you know eight, seven. That actually matches not that close but you know they're more of, of the small numbers that you would expect here okay. so i don't know if this is possible to do mjca in python but if we compare this model to our first model we get similar numbers okay. you can also plot the pretty picture okay well, mostly what i did was i copied this from the example on prince's page and filled in my data frame and then once you get past all of this stuff about pandas being mad, you get a really nice get figure, you get a really nice picture. Okay. Uh, so I like I like the picture pretty good, except for the fact that I put in uh, you know what uh, website it's on by accident. And so what you see is um, kind of a representation of where these categories kind of come together. And so in the R version, you do get a nice, um, it tells you which one it is. It's, does it swivel, yes or no? In the Python version, not so much. Uh, and with this many, it can be a little hard to interpret this picture. But you could say, well, there's a whole lot of orange over here. So there's a lot of the, the uh, word DE categories coming in together, which is the website name, so my fault. Um, but you, if we look at this, we get almost the exact same picture. So it's maybe the website may not be doing a whole lot. Okay. So which one do I like better? I would say in this one, I think R wins. Uh, this is really cool, but I wouldn't know how to read this chart because it doesn't have the labels, which I am sure one can figure out how to add. But quick and dirty, it doesn't add them automatically for me. Okay. All right. So. What we've done is looked at how to classify completely categorical data. Okay. And we've applied that to this idea of linguistic categories. For someone in maybe the business field, this might be a good way to think about keywords. So what keywords should you put on your page for search engine optimization or for users to find the thing they're looking for, right? 
So if I am looking for a armchair, <laughs> what keywords should I use to describe that armchair so, so people find it because that's what, the, what matches their category. So effectively this might be a way for me to think about what words I'm using to best represent the product that I'm selling. And I think you see some, if you look at um, websites like Wish or um, some uh, listings on Amazon that just have like 600 keywords on them. So it describes, um, I think one time I bought like a TV stand that mounts to the wall and it had like 15 adjectives in the title um, because people are trying to game the system of like, no matter which one they search, they'll find our listing. Um, this would be one way of looking at what, what words you should use for that kind of um, kind of keyword optimization. Okay. So what I could do with the data that I have from these outputs is take our dimension scores, like in our second model, um, dollar sign cord, and I could use that to actually predict something. So this might be an analysis where I'm, I'm classifying groups and then using it to predict something else. Um, and here I wouldn't be classifying. Here I might um, use that dimensionality score, which is going to be continuous, to see if there are differences in, in, in my categories. So, you know, use that in a logistic regression or, you know, flip it the other way and do a t-test difference in my categories for dimensions. Okay. And that might tell me how good I am at representing categories. So with this dimension, can I split these categories into two or three. So in summary, what did we cover today? Well, we talked about applying some new models to our basic color terms um, and talked a little bit more about categories and how to think about how to analyze completely continuous data. Okay, so we looked at chi-square because of mosaic plots, chi-square on, 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 on steroids or like chi-square on chi-square, so to speak, and looking at correspondence analysis. Um, so we did simple and multiple correspondence analysis in R and Python. And which one wins? Oh, I'm probably going to go R this week as well because um, the code is very simple. It's like two lines of code. And um, it, the plots are just a touch better with their defaults. Um, I think on both of these, if you're, if you're good at making graphics, you could make each one do what you want it to do. But if you're wanting to just do some quick something quick, the defaults for the plot options in R are a little bit more informative than the ones from Python. That being said, the Prince library is really great and will give you approximately the same answer. Okay. So sum all that up, that's simple and multiple correspondence analysis in R and Python applied to categorical data and linguistic categories.